Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We'd like to get started with today's Grand Round, where we are celebrating Community Health Improvement Week. Uh, for those of you who've not met me, I'm Tanya Vidal Kinlo, and I'm the Vice President of Community Engagement, Advocacy, and Government Affairs. So as we begin our celebration of Community Health Improvement Week, um, this is a celebration that is nationally recognized. Every year, we want to take a moment to really acknowledge the incredible work that is happening within our communities, um, to raise awareness around the activities that we're engaged in related to community health improvement, um, acknowledge the work of the professional community health and public health professionals, and to really uh, honor and recognize the partnerships that we have in the community and celebrating this activity around the work that our hospital, um, Children's National Health System, is doing to build healthier communities for our children. Um, this week is being led by the Child Health Advocacy Institute, uh, which is our community engagement, public engaging phase of our operation. Um, the CHI, our focus and our mission is to lead through collaboration um, to create policy and system change to achieve health equity for all in our community. So I think it's important to restate that. Our focus is to lead through collaboration so we know we can't do it on our own, to create policy and system change. So system change, policy change, things that are sustainable and can have lasting impact around creating equitable access to health care for everyone in our community. In designing this week, we focused on the four community health needs that were identified in our community health needs assessment. Uh, for those of you who work here at Children's National, you should know what those four are. They are place-based care, care coordination, health literacy, and mental health. We also have, as an organization, created a community health strategic plan that is focusing in three key areas, and those areas are, again, mental health, asthma, and infant mortality. And so when you participate in our Community Health Improvement Week activity, you're going to see a blend of these themes coming through in the activities that you're engaged in. This morning, what we want to do before we start the grand round is to recognize individuals in our health system who are leaders in community health improvement. And so I'd like to invite to the podium our CEO, Dr. Kurt Newman, who is going to announce the awardee for the 2019 year. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, uh, everyone, for being here today. It's uh, great to see uh, so many colleagues uh, uh, turn out and are focused on community health improvement. And it really goes back to our roots as a, as a children's hospital. Uh, you know, next year is our birthday, our 150th birthday. And we started uh, because uh, we were trying to meet uh, community, uh, community needs. If you think about it, uh, there were a group of women that started the children's hospital right after the Civil War. They did their own uh, community health needs assessment and found that there were uh, two major issues that, uh, that the community was facing. Uh, one was orphans, we call them homeless children today, and the second was uh, uh, children that were crippled, uh, either by disease or by accidents or, or whatever. So they created this hospital, which was their community health improvement plan to deal with those uh, community health needs. And we're still doing that 150 years later. Obviously, the issues are different. As, as Tanya uh, pointed out, 
uh, but the process is the same. Uh, look at what the needs in the community are and make sure, even though we've all got all these other great things going on with research, specialty care and all that, that we're meeting the needs, uh, the basic needs of children in our community. And I'm proud of that. And I'm proud uh, that uh, we're having this week celebrate it, but I know our teams are doing this every day. So these Community Health Improvement Awards uh, recognize outreach programs uh, that work with uh, in the community and shape policies that benefit children and families in the Washington metropolitan area and also recognize the providers here at Children's National who go above and beyond to help the kids and families. This is the third year we've given these awards during our community health improvement celebration. And this year we had amazing and remarkable applications from uh, so many uh, diverse communities, uh, infants and, uh, well, the infants weren't applying, but, the, uh, uh, but they were uh, directed toward infants and their caregivers, primary care cl clinicians, and school students and their parents. We had a panel of judges with expertise in public health and policy, and they selected two award winners who scored the highest in the evaluation criteria. And those criteria were community need, uh, they had to demonstrate uh, measurable outcomes, and they had, a lot, had to align with community health improvement plan priorities. Uh, Tanya just mentioned those, but I'll say them again because they're so important. Mental health, care coordination, place-based care, and health literacy. So I hope you'll join me in congratulating the work of our colleagues, friends, and tireless advocates uh, for children. And, and one thing I forgot, too, uh, is that it, it wasn't just about the children. Uh, they had to also demonstrate uh, partnerships. So that was a key criteria. So it's not just uh, a children's national thing. So we have our first awardee. Uh, this is the Discover Science with Dr. Baer. That was led by Dr. Naomi Luban and submitted by Julia Miller. And Discover Science with Dr. Bear engages children and families in the out-of-school time setting in community libraries with hands-on, inquiry-based art and science programs that help to improve the physical, cognitive, and social development of children and their families. The program explores and combines STEM with a focus on health issues of concern to the community. Finding the community uh, health uh, along with STEM principles in this unique setting. Uh, and so they focused on asthma, stress, cardiometabolic risk, sleep, genetics, and genetic diseases, and injury prevention. Uh, young people fired up about issues that are in their community, and so that they'll go into science, medicine, uh, engineering to try and tackle these problems. Uh, the program partners with community librarians who serve as Dr. Bear's fellows. And in 2018, the programming was provided to over 150 participants through drop-in style programs, family learning events, elementary STEM nights, and community-based expo, expos. Now, for those of you that don't know uh, Dr. Luban, I think she uh, has been here at least 40, 46 years. Golly. Uh, she started uh, as a prenatal fellow, <laughs> and she's still uh, going and has run and managed so many things, and uh, particularly our faculty development and, uh, and all of that. Uh, but she also has this other uh, dimension, which I think is so, uh, so cool and so critical, and uh, it, we're proud to uh, present her this award. Naomi, congratulations. And so our next awardee is Healthy Steps DC, led by the Early Childhood Innovation Network, also known as ESIN, I think, uh, and submitted by Justine Wu. Healthy Steps DC integrates parental mental health support with primary pediatric primary care. 
The team, which includes psychologists and family service associates, provides families with anticipatory guidance around parenting and child development during and between well-child visits from birth to three at the Children's Health Center in Anacostia in the Ark. So uh, I think this ties in beautifully with our grand rounds today and uh, how we're bringing primary care together uh, with mental health to identify issues early because we know that's when they're more easily addressed. Team addresses feeding, behavior, sleep, attachment, depression, access to social supports beyond health care, and how to adapt to life with a baby or young child. Well, I wish uh, I'd had a little bit of uh, that help. Uh, the Healthy Steps DC team served over 700 families in 2018. Think about that. Uh, what kind of impact uh, this uh, team had on those families. So, uh, with that, I'd like to just uh, who's picking up the award? Okay. We got the whole Healthy Steps team? Not everyone. How big is your team? So, uh, so the team the, the team is ten, and we have uh, four, four. Well, Tanya, you, you're honorary. Five uh, of the team t uh, team members uh, here. And I just for those of your team that aren't here, uh, just make sure you um, Photoshop them in. <laughs> So um, I really want to thank our, uh, uh, all the awardees, and, and also I, I think it's uh, important to thank those that, uh, made, that applied or recognized but didn't get an award, uh, because uh, I'm sure that that work is just as meaningful in different ways uh, and is having such an impact for children and families um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and these programs help us serve our communities and, like I said at the beginning, uh, tie directly back to the original mission of Children's National. It's great that we're going, getting stronger and continuing that mission. So now on to our special grand rounds. We're excited to have uh, some of my, my friends here, and I'm going to have Lee Beers uh, now introduce uh, today's guest speaker and also uh, talk a little bit about uh, why this is such a special event for Children's National. Thank you. And I have to take a point of personal privilege. I was remiss in acknowledging the amazing CHI team leaders who are responsible for this Community Health Improvement Week activity. And so I'd like to invite um, Desiree De La Torre and Dr. Danielle Dooley, who lead the Community Affairs team in the CHI, and all of the members of the Child Health Advocacy Institute to please stand. Thank you for amazing work. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce the Judy uh, at Peter Kobler Lectureship. Um, and just want to tell you a tiny bit about that, and we're delighted to have the Kobler's here with us today. Um, Judy and Peter Kobler have long been a part of our children's national family. As their children grew up, they occasionally needed our services. Our <laughs> children have. Uh, their son, Mark, was inspired to become a physician and did part of his training here at Children's, as did their daughter-in-law, Teresa. In recent years, they've kept up with the progress of the hospital and were particularly interested in our community mental health program. A psychotherapist, a private practice, and board member of DC Prep, the Washington, D.C. Charter School, Judy is keenly interested in children's outreach to the community, and Peter together have provided philanthropic support for programs that advance the mental health needs of young children. Today, we're very excited to mark the inaugural lecture of the Judy and Peter Kohler Grand Rounds of Community Mental Health. We're delighted that they could be here today with us. Thank you so much for coming and for your support. Um, and to hear uh, Dr. Olga Foster Bryce's presentation entitled Collaborative Models to Advance Mental Health in Schools. And so now, I'm going to introduce Olga. <laughs> We've got a lot of introductions. Uh, Dr. Olga Acosta Price is an associate professor in the Department of Prevention and Community Health. 
She's the director in the Center for Health and Healthcare in Schools, the National Resource and Technical Assistance Center, committed to building effective school health programs. She's a passionate advocate of school-based mental health services and has dedicated her formal training in clinical psychology to improving the lives of young people. She says, my experiences working with children, youth, and families have driven my desire to understand resilience and to approach our work together from a strength-based perspective. Giving voice to the concerns of young people is an essential priority to her, which I, I can speak to personally as I've worked with, with uh, Olga across many, many years and have seen that in action. Um, she says, I, I thoroughly enjoy creating opportunities for youth to share their insights. They don't hesitate to tell those of us who develop systems of care that we are clueless about what the world is really like for them. And that is true as well. <laughs> Prior to joining the faculty in 2006, Professor Price was the director of the School Mental Health Program at the Department of Mental Health in Washington, D.C., where she earned the Employee of the Year Award. She was also an assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and served as associate director of the Center for School Mental Health Assistance, a national technical assistance center. In that capacity, she helped promote the development of school-based mental health services across the country and is doing quite a bit of work here now. So she's going to tell us lots about the Olga Sisto for their Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. I don't know if um if this will if you can hear me okay? Okay, great. Um Okay. So I first I just want to thank you so much, uh, particularly the Chai team who um aren't just uh uh, great collaborators, but sort of uh, women in the fight to um, address equity and address and uh, and try to improve conditions for everyone in DC. And so um, they're they're friends, and I I appreciate so much all of your um, support and the invitation to be here at such an important event. Um, uh, as Lee said, I direct the center at TW. Um, it really is uh, what pays my salary <laughs> more than other things. Um, and it is a center that I'm proud to say is the only school health focused center in the country that is housed in a school of public health. So I think it's very important because it frames a lot of how we approach the work and how we emphasize the importance of social and environmental factors and um, really thinking about the social ecology and the ways that we can intervene at multiple levels and that we really can't do any of the work without partnership, it's through partnership that we get anything done. Um, so I do, um, I'm very proud of the work that the center has done and, uh, and has shaped, and as we said, I'll tell you in a moment, a little bit of, of um, an opportunity that we have here to work again in partnership with DC government, private uh, public partners to advance school mental health. Um, but really first, I, I'd like to start with a story. I first called it a case study, but I don't know if it's my case study. It's just a story, let me tell you a story. Um, it's brief, I hope. Um, I want to tell you about a young girl born the oldest of three children to Dominican parents um, who came to the country, as many immigrants do, to seek a better life for themselves and for their children. They settled in a small rural town in upstate New York where the dad had, was an electrician and a farmer, and their mom was a stay-at-home mom. They had a very modest upbringing. This is not a family who knew much about family vacations or summer camps or had very much um, to say uh, about Christmas presents to speak of, but they were a tight-knit family. Um, they worked hard and all of the basic needs were met. The daughter, although born in the U.S., spoke Spanish as her first language and had a difficult transition to school given her attachment to her mother. She had a wonderful kindergarten teacher who nurtured her and made her feel incredibly special. And it was through that relationship that she flourished and really felt successful in school. She loved school. She found her voice in school. And although her young academic career wasn't without its stressors, she experienced bullying and some shaming because of her lack of resources. She endured discrimination, both subtle and not so subtle, through her K-12 journey. She suffered a traumatic family event at 13 that changed her life, but in so many ways, school was, school was her lifeline. It wasn't just the place that she learned math and science, and it was the place she grew and that she realized she could overcome challenges. She played on a team and made lifelong friends. She developed her identity as a learner and as a Dominican-American. 
she shattered expectations of some. She became the first in her family to go to college, to graduate, uh, to go to graduate school, to earn a doctorate in psychology. If you're wondering who that is, if you haven't figured it out, it's me, the person I'm talking about. Um, my experiences, both good and bad, fuel the passion for me and the potential of what school and school health could do for someone, and particularly what I could offer to so many vulnerable children in need. My school wasn't just a place where learning happened. It was a source of enrichment and opportunity. It was a, a health provider. Uh, it was a political convening place. It was a community hub for resource and information that were needed in our very small two-light town, two-sub-light town. Um, so, um, and for so many, education really is the way to access um, and to, is a part of a critical solution to improving the disparities that we know plague and continue to exist for too many populations in the U.S. and beyond. Education itself really is an opportunity to fill the opportunity gaps that are related to the historical oppression that are really represented by this uneven ground. I love this image because sometimes it's hard to talk about equity and the difference between equity and equality and how those are distinctly different. I see some of my students or former students in my class, they've seen this slide before, I think, and I think it helps us understand that um, our approach needs to take into consideration if we want to be successful the historical oppression that many communities have faced that gets them at a different starting place, at a different level of ground, but also the present day discriminatory and racist policies and programs that are represented by the fence that unevenly obstructs the view for some and not others. And <clears throat> And when we take that into consideration with the fact that educational attainment is one of the strongest predictors of adult mortality and morbidity, um, it provides the rationale for why even in our U.S. public health um, uh, field, high school graduation within a four-year period is an indicator in the Healthy People 2020 objective. The things that make us successful in school, though, are not relegated to decisions about academic content and curricular programs, but include the culture, climate, social, and physical environment in and out of school. It's the social determinants of health, right? It's the things that are the social, environmental, physical, uh, socioeconomic conditions in which we live, learn, work, play, age, that determine so much of our outcome. It's these um, conditions that shape our opportunity and ultimately our path forward. As Balfour and colleagues say, mental disorders in particular are shaped by the social, economic, and physical environment and the social gradient in which people live and work. Risk factors for, more, for many commonly um, experienced mental disorders are heavily associated with social inequality, whereby the greater the social inequality, the greater the risk. And as you can see, these are the kinds of conditions that tap into numerous systems in which we all live. So my aim today in the time that I have with you is to look at this title, right, is to say um, what collaborative model can help us enhance mental health in schools. I want to introduce why mental health matters. I want to explain why schools are a critical partner in addressing mental health, and I want to showcase a few collaborative cross-sector models that have really included and involved pediatric health systems primarily or very substantially to improve health and educational access. But I have to start with a very stark statistic that sometimes um, we're not aware of, um, that in the United States it's important to note that our current public school population um, includes 51% of public school students who qualify for free and reduced lunch essentially our proxy or indicator for poverty. 51% today of our public school students across the U.S. And we know that this is concentrated in, in, some, in some areas and regions of the country, there are much higher populations and concentrations of poverty. And this quote that comes from um, a young woman who lives in an urban area in the U.S. 
um, is a stark reminder of what living in poverty really can mean for too many of our children. She says, my whole life is stressful. I ran away from home. There were like 13 people in that house. After a while, you know, there's not enough food and everything for everybody to be there. One winter, we had no heat. We had no electricity. We had no water. It was bad. This isn't a third world country. We're talking about a metropolitan area of the United States. And this is only three years ago that we uh, got this quote from this young lady. And when we look at the exposure to chronic adversity, particularly through landmark studies like ACEs and a national representative sample of 12 to 17 year olds, uh, this is the National uh, Study of Children's Health, found that more than half of adolescents uh, and their parents report that half of adolescents experience at least one adverse childhood experience and nearly one in 10 to experience four or more adverse stressful conditions in their life. What we know from <clears throat> this table and what we can see from this analysis that Child Trends conducted is that the greater the exposure to stress and adversity, the greater the likelihood of poor physical and academic corollary. Um, economic, and we also know that economic hardship is the most common adverse childhood experience that has been reported nationally and in almost all, across all of the states. <clears throat> the National Academies of Science just recently put out a report called a Roadmap to Reducing Childhood Poverty, in which they share a statistic that <clears throat> childhood poverty, as well as deep poverty, particularly plagues our black and Hispanic children um, at a higher rate than our white children in the country. The consequences in D.C. are quite dire and alarming. Estimates show that 50% of children, particularly those residing in Ward 7 and 8, which are about 35% of the children in D.C., and the ward was probably the largest concentration of young people, uh, residents, live in poverty. And these socioeconomic conditions are associated with a number of other really um, critical risk factors known to impact health and well-being. What the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, also tells us is that these teens experience conflict, assault, use some illegal substances at greater rates than the average U.S. high school student. They're also twice as likely to attempt suicide, particularly attempts that require medical attention, than most U.S. students. But let us not get this incorrect. This, is, this mental health problem is not a deep problem. This is a U.S. problem. <clears throat> what we know is that those 18 and under make up 24% of our U.S. population. So a quarter of our population are 18 and under. A sizable number of our population with 50 million attending public schools, 56 million being school age, 6 million roughly attending private schools, but this, the, the vast majority attending public schools. And we are talking about a segment of the population whose health and well-being warrant significant attention, especially in light of the fact that estimates have shown that 20% or one in five young people across the country experience a mental health problem that requires some immediate clinical attention. This is a, a depiction of what it often feels like and looks like in some of our schools. The numerous challenges that children bring to schools that become barriers to their learning. Um, everything from, um, and, and that are conditions and reflect conditions in which they live, not individual deficiencies and dysfunction. It's about being hungry. It's about being in abusive environments. It's about having exposure to violence. It's about being a caregiver when you don't have the requisite skills or potentially the maturity to manage all that it means to be a sole caregiver in your family. It's about being homeless. It's about being bullied. Mental health problems that go unaddressed have dire consequences, both immediate, with children being displaced through, um, from school and separated from their learning, um, at sometimes at rates three times more likely to be displaced from school than children with all other disabilities combined, but also the longer-term impact through the adoption of risky behaviors later in life or the disproportionate rate at which they acquire um, long-term physical chronic health conditions. The research on adult use of mental health points to the fact that racial and ethnic minorities are less likely to utilize mental health services than white Americans. This is a trend we know is reflected in youth mental health utilization, especially when we talk about traditional mental health settings. 
What we know is that those who need mental health support often do not receive it, particularly within a year of experiencing significant symptoms or their diagnosis. And um, but that those who need mental health support are more likely to regularly receive that report, that support when they're in school. But these figures point to, alongside the statistics, that symptoms of adult mental illness are likely to start by adolescence, and 75% of adult mental illness um, can trace back early symptoms to age, about from age 24, early adulthood. That really tells us, and um, I think need to motivate us to think about strong prevention and promotion strategies that are critical to addressing mental health challenges. Although I, uh, I have the pleasure of teaching at the graduate level and I teach school health and safety and mental health promotion um, at the graduate level at GW, um, and I also um, have the honor of speaking to various audiences, I always talk about the fact that we as public health and sometimes health care providers talk about the, the reason we like to be in schools is because schools are a convenient place to be because we have a captive audience of students who are there seven hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of the year, so then we can find them. They're there. And so I won't disagree that it is a very important place to offer health education and services, but I really underscore that schools are actually dynamic systems that have a lot of other benefits why we want to partner with them. They are places where there are an incredible number of caring adults who forge and form relationships with young people, like my kindergarten teacher or my 10th grade English teacher. Um, and we know very much from the, best, from the research that these relationships serve as protective factors, buffering young people against the adversity that we can't um, shelter them from. There are also a multitude of programs that exist in schools across the health spectrum and the education spectrum. Not often well integrated, not often coordinated, but often very good um, programs that are available through schools. We know that there are very influential practices that happen in schools and policies both at the health and education level, a multiple level of our ecology that we need to consider. It's a very complex system. It is an important system for our young people. And schools are very familiar with how to organize resources in a way that they try to identify the individual needs of students, and uh, particularly when it comes to their academic needs, and to integrate school and community resources to weave together a net of support. This is something schools know how to do. They're expert at this. Um, they do so thinking about um, the needs of a whole population, what we call our tier one which are school-wide programs that benefit all students, that touch all students, and support things like healthy development, healthy relationships, safety in schools, and teach and support self-regulation. It's tier two interventions, which are really targeted to assist those students with mild or emerging symptoms who are known to be living and have experienced risk factors where we need to identify them. It's also tier three, or specialized or intensive services, treatment services for those who know exhibit symptoms or meet criteria for a particular diagnosis. But the interventions are also focusing on creating positive and nurturing environments, helping adults manage their own stress, and learn how to manage classroom behaviors effectively. It's about adjusting discipline and attendance policies so they take into account the barriers to learning and the social determinants of health and education. So schools have long been a part of a solution for many of us, for the ways that we want to address and tackle the disparities, the health and educational disparities that exist with our young people, um, and to promote equity. The research and our practices indicate that for children, schools are a critical setting for mental health to be offered, especially um, when it's not just about treating and diagnosing, but because of the unique benefits around preventing the development of behavioral disorders. Schools are essential partners in that work. The benefits include integrating the fact that we can often do no better in terms of improving access to care than co-locating services in and around school. That we offer very naturally a continuum of services, as I indicated, um, tier one, two, and three types of supports and services. That we have early detection systems that can be uh, ignited and, and, and used in schools. Um, 
and that we often can see not just better psychosocial outcomes, but academic outcomes, because they're addressing the whole child. And it's a place that we promote youth, family, educator, and peer joint engagement. This is what we call comprehensive school mental health. So I think we've discussed briefly why to focus on mental health, and we've talked about why in schools are critical partners. So now I want to share a few points about collaborative partnerships between schools, families, and health systems that allow us to maximize the learning outcomes. The first and I think most prominent and one of the most important collaborative health models and the most popular that we think about is school nursing. Um, um, who, nurses who are sometimes hired by the school district, but in many cases are hired and managed by outside entities like health departments or hospital systems as in the case in D.C. Another really important collaborative model consists of the delivery of pediatric health through school-based health centers. Public health centers provide convenient, accessible, comprehensive health care to children um, in grades K to 12 through partnership between schools and a known sponsor agency, utilizing an interdisciplinary provider team that's integrated within the school setting. So, in addition to primary care, which is usually the base of the school health centers offering very robust primary care services for acute and chronic conditions, school based health centers offer um, other services mental health care, oral health care health education, case management, substance use treatment, screening, and preventive intervention. What we know from our colleagues and our national partners at the School Based Health Alliance is that as of our last census, we have 2,584 school based health centers across the country, serving about 6 million children um, across the U.S. in more than 10,000 schools. So roughly about 13% of the children and about 10% of the public schools across the country. The evidence of their impact has been well documented. Better health and education outcomes that has led to the Community Preventive Services Task Force to recommend that implementing school-based health services and through school-based health centers nationwide um, is recommended, particularly in low-income communities. Although FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, are the predominant sponsor of school-based health centers, Hospital systems like Children's Hospital sponsor 20% of the school-based health centers nationally. And the latest census also tells us that school-based health centers are in schools that serve poor children who have limited access to quality care for many reasons. School-based health centers have also been shown to improve access and to eliminate barriers to physical and behavioral health, as well as reducing emergency room visits, health care costs, it's especially true for students who exhibit high-risk behaviors and those known to underutilize services traditionally, particularly minority youth and boys, particularly adolescent boys. Mobile health units, another important collaborative uh, school health system partnership that reduces the burden of finding space in schools, for one, which um, although may not seem like a big issue for some of us, is really a big issue for schools. Um, space is of, of prime importance um, and um, or meeting the regulatory health requirements um, in buildings that are often not designed to host health providers or health services. But I want to also spend a few minutes talking about school telehealth programs, which have been used to connect children and families to both physical and mental health care, especially in areas around the country where they flourished, where there are provider shortages, and limited access to a variety of health specialists and medical specialists. Colleagues and I at GW have uh, published a review of the school-based telemedicine evaluation outcomes and found that um, studies have shown that there are high completion and treatment protocol adherence rates when using school-based telehealth and that health status improvement, especially for children with asthma and diabetes, has been noted, improved communication and collaboration between students, parents, providers, and school administration. Um, these are all things that have been gleaned from the existing literature. But there are areas that we need to continue to focus on. There are no evaluation of the factors related to readiness of schools to implement telehealth services. Um, you can't just assume that the context is ready for the level of engagement and sophistication that may be needed to implement services such as this. And there are very few um, cost-benefit or cost-effective cost effectiveness is estimates 
a school telehealth from a provider or a broader societal perspective. So we have room to really grow as it relates to our knowledge base. <clears throat> the qualitative study that we also conducted in a neighboring uh, county um, about the impact of, um, of school telemedicine found that when parents uh, were asked why they didn't enroll their child in a telemedicine um, program, in addition to the fact that they indicated they often didn't know or understand the program very well, that, um, that one of the main reasons is that they preferred taking their child to their own primary care provider, the trusted provider who they've always taken the child to. Um, but uh, regardless of the fact that often they would need to um, leave work and take their child out of school in order to, to make that visit. Here's a quote from a provider about the value of telemedicine to expand care. ADD is a perfect example, he says, to be able to talk to the teacher or the principal and the guidance counselor, see the student in a school setting um, on an illness that affects school performance, that could revolutionize the treatment base. Not to mention the fact that mom doesn't have to take off work and the student doesn't need to leave school. It provides opportunity for better integrated care for more transparent and regular communication that is certainly going to enhance the medical um, uh, visit as well as their health outcome. Oops, sorry, wrong way. And then a second um, quote from a principal about the ways to connect across systems to support um, both ends. You know, maybe there's a way to survey parents in some way about what doctors they use, and if there's a high number of families across the school that use the same pediatrician, try to get them to be a part of it, because I think the biggest challenge is with parents wanting to use their own doctors. But if their doctors, if their top doctors was a part of it, meaning the school telemedicine program, then I think we would be able to enroll more families. So I think there's a real interest, particularly among the, the education community and the school leader community, to really enhance and strengthen these collaborative models. So let me tell you some of the reasons we should be very excited about the fact that there's a lot of good stuff happening in D.C. Um, there has been for a long time uh, a lot of partners and the work of CHI and other very important uh, agencies in D.C., um, but it's really coalesced to a point when, uh, where there's a very intentional um, plan and an intentional approach to try to implement a comprehensive school-based behavioral health system across D.C. that will benefit all um, public school children and their families. Um, we really need to be excited about this direction as we think about um, uh, the fact that this expansion is really aiming to leverage the services that the agencies and our community-based providers are already strong in doing and delivering. It's intended to, per to really touch 100% of the students through primary prevention and health promotion. It's providing public school students with the broadest and consistent, seamless access to behavioral health services across the multiple tiers of support. And it's using public and private district resources more effectively and efficiently. For example, we're really excited that there are private uh, philanthropic uh, funders who are very interested in the ways that they could better leverage their investment to support this uh, public approach, public health approach. And these are the steps that are really being taken in the plan to assess the current practices and to build the capacity of both the school, school providers, and the CBO partners. But although I feel very excited about the direction the city's heading in, into, um, I will um, announce, I think before our press release comes out, that our Center for Health and Health Care Schools has been identified and awarded the contract with the city to provide technical assistance uh, and to facilitate a community of practice for schools and um, providers in D.C. to really implement best practices in school mental health over the next five years. So we are humbled and honored to, to do that. Thank you. Many of our partners are here. Thank you. And again, we, we're not doing this alone. We're really doing this uh, leading by collaboration. Is that what you said, Tanya, right? So, um, right. I like that. And it's, um, but there are still challenges to establishing partnerships, right? We know that if it was easy to do, we'd all be doing it much more. Uh, when thinking about, especially when thinking about large hospital systems that sometimes are driven by regulatory compliance or that need to prioritize revenue setting, uh, generating resources and services, which is not how one would describe school health programs. They are just 
thank you, Lee, they are not revenue-generating ventures. That's okay, but we just need to be honest about that. Issues of data sharing and privacy with regard to HIPAA and CERPA oversight, which often we stumble over, uh, as well as issues about the use of electronic health systems and, tech and uh, technology platforms, which may or not be supported by the systems that we're working in. These are challenges, although real, they can be overcome with planning, transparent communication, and dedicated resources. But there, I want to end on opportunity. I think there's some really incredible opportunities to strengthen partnerships between schools and particularly pediatric health systems. First, um, knowing and working closely with um, our partners in CHI that the importance of mapping the programs and the services that are linked to schools across the pediatric health system is an incredible important step. And it's something that's already been done through the report that, uh, and the ongoing uh, school health collaborative that has been formed here at Children's, which I really do uh, uh, sort of uh, celebrate that work. It's about maintaining regular communication about resources in which schools need to remain knowledgeable and informed. Why? Because if you haven't also noticed, one of the highest turnover rates in our education well, let's just say there are high turnover rates in the education for everything from the state superintendent's office all the way down to a teacher level, right? Those rates are very alarming, um, and they're very disruptive to system building work. Um, I think the average superintendent might stay in his or her post 18 to 24 months. Um, if you think about what that does to an LEA or to a large district who is trying to promote and push a particular set of agendas, um, you can imagine why it's so hard to get traction out of that. We're lucky if each other superintendent runs longer than that average. Um, uh, principals, again, often as leaders of buildings, um, don't have long tenures in their schools. And um, it, it, we're sad to say that DC has one of the highest rates of teacher and administrator turnover in the country. Um, I share that because then regular communication and methods of understanding what health resources and services and programs are available has to continually invest in letting your education leaders know that because it will often be new people at the help. Consider ways to enhance case management. You all know how to do case management here very well. Schools do not. And don't, they don't have dedicated resources to doing that. To really try to think about ways that you might enhance the case management function to really include school-based providers, both school hired and non-school hired, so that we really can create a much uh, more robust net of support for those families who need all types of services um, to really make them successful. And lead the way to exploring the viability, the impact, and cost benefits of school telehealth programs. I think you're in a very unique position to lead on some of the research as it relates to um, the viability, the types of outcomes that could be expected, particularly in RDC context, and the cost benefits for um, the effectiveness of those, of those programs. And finally, to ensure that community benefit investments that you all um, do participate in are aligned with and complement other local initiatives, and that they really are driving our collective impact forward. Um, so I'll end by saying that I, I, it goes without saying, I guess, that um, these innovative models to co-locate or make accessible a variety of health services have been known to improve access and quality of care, especially for the most vulnerable among us. The education sector can meaningfully partner with pediatric health systems, particularly in advancing a multi-level intervention to address what are very complex social and environmental conditions that impact our students and as well being at home. So, thank you very much. So, I think we have a few minutes. I didn't know if um, we have any questions. Come on, students. Do you have questions? Gigi. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I'm Gigi Elbayumi from the Rodham Institute dedicated to improving health equity in D.C. We had actually commissioned a study that looked at what the health priorities of residents living in Ward 7 and 8 
are in the actual mental health system. Yeah. As an adult uh, general internist, thank you for coming here to children is like such a great thing. Everybody's so nice and friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I know, aren't they great? I come here as much as I can. I, know, I love it. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, but um, the, the, the gap in terms of adults, I have been inviting for adults because the reality is this is a big blind spot for practitioners that deal with adults. And yet, if we think about the parents of these children, the people who actually work in our systems, right, the staff that predominantly come from Ward 7 yeah. and yeah. that's another opportunity, not so much at the school level, but at the health systems level to actually do some of this education. So can, Very you good speak, point. can you please yeah. speak to how we can do better in terms of the adult uh, piece as, as clinicians? And yeah. Thank you. I think there, um, what you said really does resonate. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, it's not unusual. We're very philosophical. We very philosophically aligned, Gigi. Um, is that a um, couple things that, that you said that really resonate. One is that um, children's also, as, as, a, as a teaching hospital, is in a really powerful position to, as you're doing here, as you often do, but to really push and promote and integrate uh, education around mental health, but not only from the perspective of treatment and what we know to be evidence-based and good care, but from the perspective of what we can do around addressing some of these other systemic issues that really do serve to drive the expression of these mental health conditions and the sort of the, the prevalence of those conditions. And so um, I think that's really critical, and I think this body here is, is a testament to the, the interest in that. Um, I think that um, one of the things that my, my colleague Marisa Perl is over there and Julia, I think one of the things that we're trying, we're also trying to promote, it's a little different than what you're saying, but I want to take this time to say it, is that adult well-being is, so again, another area where we need more research to really drive kind of strategy. We know this, though, intuitively. We know it from practice-based evidence. We know it from the emerging evidence that adult well-being is critical to child well if we did, If I did no interventions directly to students and only focused on the adult stress level, the vicarious traumatization that's happening with our teachers and the adults and providers, if I uh, worked on the ways that they could set the kind of culture and climate that's about uh, nurturing and it's about seeing every individual and their and right and their uh, and the benefits that every one of them contributes to the environment. If we focus just there, there would be an impact, a positive impact on every child. Um, to a degree that I think we would shift some of those population level outcomes that we want to see hit, um, but it hasn't been a priority. I think in D.C. it is becoming a priority, um, and that is really exciting opportunity. But I agree with you. I think that our provider community, I say that very inclusively, and to include our educators as providers of education, to include our, our health and medical and public health provider communities, um, do not have, I think, the uh, exposure to the kinds of information to understand the ways that they might um, screen themselves as part of, like, what are the ways that they can, in, in their routine practices, um, really integrate what we know to be these important practices so that we are identifying much earlier, we are shortening the level of time between diagnosis and treatment, which we know in adults is a long time, uh, as well as in young in children. Um, so I think that we, and, and you and your center do an amazing job with your aim around education and around um, the priorities coming from the community driving what your center priorities are. So I think we really need to take advantage of um, these incredible opportunities to open up the doors, involve, invite more people to these kinds of educational opportunities. Um, it's a shame that in the School of Public Health I teach the only class that's focused on mental health, behavioral health, as from a public health perspective. Um, we have another class that's on global mental health, um, and that's important, but I really want to make sure that our domestic systems really integrate what we know to be best practices. So it, it just speaks to the fact that behavioral health 
in a lot of our traditional health systems has been a stepchild. Uh, and it's is not to be very sick. Good morning, um, Dr. Price. This Good morning. is Devine uh, White from Howard University. Um, thank you for an excellent lecture. I really appreciate it, the information thank you. and your devotion. Um, you started out with your history and how, as a young child, you were influenced in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So most of the school-based health centers yeah. are in high school. Right. So can you address why we need to start more in elementary school and whether or not there is a plan to do so? Yeah. I can, I'll start with the latter. I don't know if there's a plan. That's something certainly that we can ask our, our oversight of our, our the Department of Health and in some of the planning there. You should know that May the 5th, this evening, I think there is a public health town, there's a town hall meeting around the, um, the preventive services block grant that basically is what the Department of Health is, the way they're going to prioritize um, and utilize some of the funding to the block grant that is open to public testimony. And so again, take advantage of opportunities to make your voices heard. Um, as residents and um, as contributors in the city. Um, I do think it's important, you know, it's part of the school health centers which have had a really interesting history of how they've developed nationally. Um, they, are, they are lightning rods for political um, reactivity. And um, to the degree that it, it much, sometimes this is the kind of program or service that needs to have a sort of strong public will that, that basically forces the systems to acknowledge and to invest where the community feels it should be. Um, it has traditionally in many ways, it grew out of an, an appreciation for adolescent health and how um, we do it. So it really grew out of a need to address the, uh, the lack of services provided to adolescent health. Um, and the fact that they didn't go to community-based um, services regularly. But it certainly, we have many examples across the country of where it has been very effectively utilized uh, as a co-located service in elementary and middle uh, throughout the spectrum. Um, but again, I think that it's part of then our duty as, as citizens, as voters, as individuals to advocate if we feel that we should now have, having said that, I think, again, some of these other models have, have been aimed to address where those gaps exist as it relates to access to care and maintaining high quality care, um, bringing specialists and making available specialists for certain um, acute and chronic conditions. Um, and as it relates to behavioral health, I'm happy to say that the, that the comprehensive plan, but even before that, is really through K-12. So we've been, um, and, and is inclusive now of preschool, but pre-K programs that are in public buildings. So it's inclusive of those programs too. So I think that, and, and really taking the, the lead from the incredible work of Ethan, we're gonna be able to really blend and, and uh, lead these things together. But I think it's an important point, we shouldn't lose it, um, because we should celebrate the many things and the ways that DC has been at the forefront and has been a pioneer um, in a lot of things. Um, our statistics sometimes don't bear those out, but. Um, I think we, we have invested quite a bit. It's a matter of the ways that we can bridge those and link those and coordinate those better. 